Hello there. In anticipation of the long-awaited season five of Peaky Blinders, we thought it'd be good to catch everyone up on what's happened with the Shelby family and their gang over the past several years. It's been quite a tumultuous time, after all. Right then, so, we're gonna run through the main characters of season one before we dive in, and we're gonna do it quickly. Very, very quickly. And here we go. Tommy Shelby is the second oldest brother in charge of the family and more importantly, the family business. And for the sake of summary and concision here, he's the main character of this particular program. Arthur Shelby is the eldest brother and Tommy's right-hand man. John Shelby is the third oldest and is also deeply involved in the family business. Then we've got the sister, Ada Shelby, a communist fiancé, Freddy Thorne, oh, and also that aunt Polly Gray. Polly ran the business while the three boys were over in France fighting the Huns. On the other side of the fence, you've got Chief Inspector Chester Campbell, who is a massive prick to the Shelby family, his beautiful undercover agent Grace Burgess, and the racetrack running gangster Billy Kimber, who, if we've been forthright here, is also a fairly huge prick. Oh, and also they're called the Peaky Blinders because they're so riser blades into the brims of their caps to use as a weapon. Properly badass. Okay, onto the meat of the matter. We start in 1918 Birmingham, England, in the charming neighbourhood of Small Heath with the Shelby family, an Irish Romany family of bookmakers. We already know about them. As we discussed, the three eldest brothers run the Shelby Company Limited after all returning from fighting in France during the Great War. You probably know it as World War I, where Tommy won several medals for valour. Birmingham is an industrial and downright gritty place, and most of the people who live there are hard labourers, steel workers and boatmen and the like. But not the Shelbys. The Shelbys have shirked their humble beginnings and are now de facto bosses of the city in which they were raised. Tommy wants to knock off the main racetrack bookmaker in the region, Billy Kimber, to make the blinders the largest bookmaking operation around, and sets out an elaborate plan to enact this, beginning, of course, with stealing an enormous cache of machine guns, which are quite new and fancy and very hard to come by at this time, as well as a full lorry's worth of ammunition from the local BSI factory. Since it's suspected that the Peaky Blinders were behind the robbery... If you see any guns, check the serial numbers against that list. The IRA, Communists and British government, in the form of Major Campbell, are all in town looking for them, and are looking for them very hard indeed, with great purpose. What bloody gods, Tommy! Now, this juncture, Tommy purposely starts a war with the Lees, another travelling Romany family, and proceeds to use the hidden guns as leverage to play all the parties off against each other. What's our mission, boy? To stick it to the Lee family, Arthur! Basically, everyone wants the guns, but only Tommy knows where they're hidden away. Well, you get the idea. He's basically untouchable under this particular arrangement. And I'm in your hands completely. But if you marry her, our family and the Lee family will be united forever. And this war will be over. Now, it's up to you, John. War. Peace. But after an encounter with the IRA at the peaky home pub, the garrison goes awry. And ends with two extremely dead Irishmen on the floor. Tommy is betrayed by his barmaid, Grace, who, as I mentioned earlier, is an undercover officer working for the chief inspector. A fucking crown. So the government recovers the guns. Effectively destroying his hand, Tommy is properly fucked. With the investigation into the missing guns all wrapped up, Major Campbell declares his love for Grace, but she rejects him as he later learns that she's fallen for Tommy during her time undercover, which, of course, the Major is not too pleased to hear. With the IRA dealt with and Winston Churchill recalling the Chief Inspector to London, but also with no leverage to speak of, the Shelby family seeks a new way to protect themselves from Kimber and his frankly much larger operation. After much rumination and whiskey, Tommy settles on John marrying a Lee daughter, unbeknownst to John, unfortunately, but meaning that the Shelbys and the Lees are now outlined which is fantastic news from an organizational security standpoint. Yeah, all right. The boys seek to stand off against Kimber at the racetrack's way out of town, but are betrayed again. And with the Lee clan en route to the wrong location, Kimber and his men come to Birmingham right to Small Heath to kill the blinders. And of course, there are no coppers about because Major Campbell has recalled them all from the streets. A tense standoff in the street has ended when Kimber opens fire, whipping Tommy and killing Danny Wisman. Good man. Tommy promptly puts a bullet in Kimber's head, declares that they've fought this war one-on-one -on -one and that Kimber had lost. Everyone then disperses. Now for the big season one cliffhanger, which I, for one, don't think anyone saw coming. 
In the final scenes, we see Detective Campbell, humiliated and furious. The crisis formed for Tommy, not him. Raise his pistol to her face on the train tracks, cut into black before we hear a single gunshot. What the fuck? Did he kill her? Apparently, we'll have to wait. But no need to wait too long because, hey, we're already back with season two of Peaky Blinders, or at least a brief little retelling of it. We've got all the same characters as season one, with a few new additions. Finn Shelby, who is no longer a small child but a teenager, nearly a man, learning the family business. Michael Gray, Polly's estranged son, and Esme Lee, now Shelby, the shotgun bride of John from the previous season. We've also got Alfie Solomons, the leader of the Jewish gang down in London, and of course, Darby Sabini, volatile leader of the Italian gang that controls most of England's capital city, and just a nasty little fellow all round. Remember a few minutes ago when I told you that Chief Inspector Campbell tried to shoot Gray at the train station? Well, guess what? That sneaky lass has a hidden purse gun, and she shot first. Seriously, but not mortally wounding him, such that he walks with a limp and a cane now. Sometimes that's the way it goes, and he's a complete tosser anyways. So, on to the main event. Several years later, we find the Peaky Blinders in Birmingham Small Heath, with Shelby Company Limited running smoothly and making a lot of money. But almost immediately, and I mean like first few minutes of episode one, the garrison, Tommy's pub, is blown up by the IRA, who, it turns out, are interested in having him commit a murder on their behalf. Hell of a way to get a man's attention. Tommy also decides that this, of all times, is the time for the blinders to move into London, where the rival Italian and Jewish gangs are engaged in a brutal turf war. Suffice to say, there's a lot going on for the Shelbys at the moment. You blew up my pub which is not lost on Polly and Esme, who are not really on board with the rapid expansion plans that Tommy has unilaterally begun. On a brighter note, Tommy discovers the child that Polly had taken from her when she was young, a teenager named Michael, and the two are, with some trouble, reunited. I think she might be my mother. After a tense negotiation, Tommy agrees to ally with Alfie Solomons and his Jewish gang, and the blinders start taking over London swiftly and without mercy. Borrow a fries from Mr. Sabini. Alfie had invited a horde of wild animals and unlocked the fucking gates. My face is the last thing you'll ever see on Earth. In the meantime, a faction of the IRA has allied themselves with Major Campbell, who is tasked by Winston Churchill with the assassination of a British military official. And it was decided that Tommy is to be the triggerman. There are fucking rules for a fucking reason. Quite simply, they have to be obeyed. All right. The gang heads to London to buy a horse and carry out the task at hand. Thomas Shelby. And are attacked by Sabini's men, killing or wounding all of the assassins. As it turns out, Sabini's trigger men were now a match for Arthur and John's rage. The pro treaty, Paddy's and the king want the same man dead. After a night of violent revenge against Sabini. This place is under new management. By order of the Peaky Blight. Blinders are betrayed by Alfie in favour of Sabini, and Arthur is framed in London for the murder of Billy Kitchen, a Blinders lieutenant, and sentenced to the gallows. Back in Birmingham, Michael is arrested by Campbell due to the spite he holds for Tommy and his brothers. Tommy is able to strike a deal with Major Campbell for Michael and Arthur's freedom, even though his eventual plan is to betray Tommy upon the completion of his assassination task. You see, Campbell is intent on blaming the assassination on a specific faction of the IRA, which would spark an all-out civil war back in Ireland. John blows up the residence of Tommy's target, making it possible to move the actual assassination to the location of Sabini's biggest horse race. At the race, Tommy is approached by Grace, who has returned from America to tell him that the child she is pregnant with is his. Tommy departs to kill the military official, while Polly corners and kills Major Campbell with a single shot to the heart. Don't fuck with the Peaky Blinders. The ensuing panic draws all the police away from the track, and the Blinders move in to take over the betting operations. Unfortunately, Tommy is abducted by three IRI members in police uniforms, under the orders of the now deceased Campbell. But as he stands over a rural grave waiting to be shot, one of his would-be assassins shoots the other two, informing Tommy that Churchill still needs him in the future. Overwhelmed with emotion, Tommy sets off home to propose to Grace, telling no one of what just happened. And there we have season two. You get to catch up on it right fucking away, don't you? You lucky bastards. 
As we open on season three, two years later, things are going very well for our boy Tommy. He lives in a palatial estate outside of the city. I mean, this thing looks like a proper castle. It's the day of his wedding to the love of his life, Grace. The wedding is beautiful and joyous, but at the reception following the ceremony, we learn that Tommy has business plans tonight too. Plans with the Russians and a little killing too. Students of history, around this time, there was something in Russia called the Bolshevik Revolution. Communists took over the government, created the USSR, and ah yes, killed off as much of the royal family as they could find. Some of the Romanovs managed to escape to the West, and these are the ones Tommy finds himself meeting with on his wedding night. The Russians tell him they're interested in protection given their precarious political standing in the country. And while feigning poverty for the government have a copious amount of jewels and treasure they smuggled into the country. As payment, Tommy is offered a truly enormous sapphire necklace, which he gives to his new wife, Grace. Prior to the wedding, the blinders burn down an Italian-owned shopping town to dissuade its owner, Angel Changretta, from attending the wedding as Lizzie's date. Angel's father confronts them about this. John responds by blinding Angel. This will come up again in a bit. Around this same time, Tommy is approached by a priest, a very odd priest, who claims to represent a very odd group, the Odd Fellows. The Odd Fellows, otherwise known as the Economic League, is a shady group of wealthy right-wing elites in Britain who are very interested in making sure that labor movements like that of the Bolsheviks don't take hold in the West. In Tommy's case, they are supposedly interested in facilitating an arms deal between the Blinders and the Russians. We'll talk more about that later. At a party the following evening, Tommy is laughingly informed by the Russian princess Tatiana that the necklace he has been paid with bears a curse. He rushes to find Grace, who is wearing it, but it is too late. And an Italian oh, gunman, hired by Angel, fires a shot for Tommy directly into her heart. Furious, Tommy retreats to his home, but not before sending John and Arthur out to kill Angel and his parents. Since Mrs. Changretta had been the boy's school teacher growing up in Small Heath, they allow her to leave on the condition she not tell Tommy. Tommy plans to torture the old man, but Arthur takes pity and puts a bullet in his head before he can. Meanwhile, Tommy sits down with the Russians to negotiate the terms of the planned arms deal. With the help of Alfie, an accord is struck whereby the blinders will give £70,000 in jewellery in exchange for a fleet of armoured tanks. But it quickly becomes clear that Tommy has larger plans than that. He does not trust the Russians one bit and plans to rob them blind, taking everything. In a late night, let's say, rendezvous between Tommy and Tatiana, Tommy tells Tatiana that he needs to kill the priest, who has been lying to them and is acting as a spy for interests other than their own. She agrees. The next day, he places a bullet with Father Hugh's name on it in his pistol and sets out to kill the bastard. But Hughes anticipated the attack, and Tommy is beaten within an inch of his life by the priest's men. The priest and the rest of the odd fellows allow Tommy to live, under the condition that he apologized to him in front of the Russians, and also with the threat that failure to do so will result in the death of Tommy's only son. A bleak situation indeed. After a truly crazy night of revelment at the Russians, the goal of which was to access the floor plans, the boys return home and begin laying out plans for a tunnel from outside the grounds directly into the vault. Tommy was a tunneler in France, remember? The following morning, as Grace's funeral service wraps up, Father Hughes approaches Tommy to inform him of the odd fellow's plans for him. As it turns out, the arms deal was indeed a setup, with the larger goal of blowing up the wholesale, killing several rail workers and pinning it on the new Bolshevik government, which would in turn cause the British government to cut off diplomatic ties with the communists. And guess who is tasked with this whole mess of a plan? To ensure Tommy's compliance, the old fellows kidnap his son. We have your son. Leaving him with no choice but to carry out the Economic League's wishes. It's a race against the clock, however, as the robbery and bombing are set to take place literally minutes apart from each other. As a good heap of the blinders, led by Michael, take off looking for Tommy's young son, Tommy himself heads to the tunnel, and Arthur, John, and Finn head to the rail yard to set up the dynamite. The plan is, if the child is rescued before the bombing is set to occur, it is to be called off. But if not, well, boom. The robbery goes off without a hitch, and the blinders find the priest with Tommy's son before the explosion as well. Michael, impetuous to kill the priest himself due to the abuse he had suffered at Hughes' hand as a young boy, takes a very long time to finish the job, almost dying himself at one point. Who wants to be in heaven when you can be sending men to fucking hell? And by the time Finn is informed of the child's safety, the train is blown to utter smithereens. 
Well, at least one thing went according to plan this evening. As Tommy returns with all the Russian royal's treasure, having completely cleaned them out, and his son is safe, which is worth even more, it's revealed that all of this was a plan he had cooked up with Princess Tatiana, who was the mystery buyer Tommy had lined up for the jewels all along. Back at his estate, Tommy gathers the family to distribute the large piles of cash they have all been promised from the proceeds of the robbery. Unfortunately, he also informs everyone gathered that due to the influence of the odd fellows in the British government, they are all to be arrested and sent to the executioner for their various crimes. As the season comes to a close, Tommy swears that he will get them all out before they are hanged, and all the Shelbys, except for him, are hauled off by the police. Guess what? We've got a whole season left, season four. To start off, we see Arthur, John, Michael and Polly all being led to the gallows, where despite Tommy's explicit promises at the end of season three, it appears they'll meet their fate at the end of the hangman's rope. However, at the last moment they are saved, as Tommy has ransomed letters from the king implicating the crown in the previous season's train bombing fiasco for their safety. Oh, and Tommy also gets a knighthood for himself as Lord Cherry on top. Thomas Shelby has asked for the king to award him an OBE, sir. Jumping forward a year later, the Shelby family is in up to disarray. John and Arthur live out in the country with their families, and Polly is back in her peaceful town home, drinking herself positively mad. It seems like everyone was permanently fucked up from their brush with the executioner, which is reasonable, but that doesn't keep the demons of the Shelby family from coming back to haunt them. If you recall, a few years back, the brothers killed a man named Vicente Changrata, the husband of their old school teacher. Well, Vicente's son Luca is now the head of the New York Mafia. Yes, that Mafia. And has come to England to declare vendetta on the Shelbys. And heralds this by delivering a black hand to everyone. It's a Mafia practice whereby if you receive one, you are properly fucked. After killing a Mafia spy in his estate's kitchen staff, Tommy makes a decision that the entire family is to move back to their old neighborhood of Small Heath in Birmingham where they can be protected by the locals who are loyal to the blinders. Everyone but John agrees, and while Michael visits him in his rural home to convince him to change his mind, they're ambushed by Lucas Tommy Gunn wielding hatchetmen, leaving Michael seriously injured and John dead. Tommy also enlists the help of fellow Romany named Abraham Gold, who, we quickly learn, is a ruthless killer and father of an excellent young prize fighter. Abrahama sets out to kill as many Italians as he can, and quickly dispatch four of Luca's men, two at John's funeral and two in an outright ambush in the Changretta car as it passed through the woods. Luca himself escapes unharmed and absolutely spitting mad. The next day, a labour dispute leaves one of Tommy's factories unguarded, and two Mafia hitmen enter through the back door looking to kill Arthur. Luckily, Arthur is a fucking maniac and kills them both. One of them by hitting him with a hammer and then drowning him in paint. Very Arthur, I think we can all agree. Tommy has also recently grown his liquor exportation business. Remember, there's prohibition in the US at this time, and he's now making gin, a popular drink amongst wealthy American women at the time. But more on this in a tick. The family learns of a plot to lure Arthur to an apartment of a family enemy, and sets up a trap for the Mafia assassins. But sometimes even the blinders get their information wrong. And it turns out Luca has taken his men to the hospital where Michael is convalescing. Killing the guard posted by the room, Luca storms in and places a pistol to Michael's forehead, but instead of pulling the trigger, informs him that he is to be spared. Although it is somewhat unclear at this point, it seems that Polly has struck a deal to give up Tommy in exchange for her and Michael's lives. Boy in the hospital's out of bounds, and I'll ask you to spare Finn and Arthur. And we're done for a while. No action is without equal and opposite reaction, and following the threat on Michael's life, Tommy sets up a trap in the familiar alleys of Small Heath, luring the Changretta crew into an open courtyard before firing on them with a truly gigantic machine gun he never gave back in season one. A firefight occurs throughout the town and its tenements, with Tommy killing all but one of Luca's men. As the two leaders seemingly agree to duel with pistols in the street, the police show up and Luca flees. At this point, Luca reaches out to Alfie Solomon in hopes that Alfie will give him better access to the Shelby clan than he's been able to achieve thus far on his own. Alfie's nephew is set to square off against Abraham Gold's son in a boxing match, and Luca pays Alfie for access to the venue where the entire Shelby family will be. 
As the day of the bout approaches, the family is tense but generally excited for the fight, aware of the still present threat after the match begins. Arthur follows a suspicious looking man into a back hallway and is ambushed and seemingly killed. The wild eyed Tommy bursts in and shoots the assassin and then storms back into the arena to furiously announce that Arthur is no more. Later, the family is approached by Mrs. Changretta, who claims that her son will end the vendetta in exchange for all the Shelby businesses and assets. Absolutely all of it. Tommy agrees, and the next day he meets Luca and his men at the Shelby Gin Distillery to sign the papers. Unbeknownst to Luca, however, Tommy has made a deal with the other Matthew families of New York, and now Luca's men work for them. Just like that, the other families can take over all of the Changretta territory without a fight, because it appears Luca was killed in a personal feud with a random bookmaker all the way over in England. Everybody wins. Except Luca, of course, because moments later, Arthur bursts into the room, his death having been a hoax, and shoots Luca right in the forehead, as he had promised he would in vengeance for John's murder. With the war over, Tommy decides it's time to move on to new business offering valuable information on the Communist Party, betraying a few close friends in doing so, Tommy is granted a role in Parliament. In the final moments, we see him and his family descending the steps of the State House, prepared to take on this new chapter in the Shelby family's future. And that's that, folks. We'll see you soon in the first episode of the much-awaited Season 5, by order of the Peaky Blinders.